Hey YouTube, it's Right Lane here going live again. Um, haven't been around for a while. I've been around, just haven't done any recordings. Anyway, um, working on getting that subscription base up so we can be a little more proactive. I'd love to be able to do some live, some interaction. My story here is just that uh, been over the road now for about seven months, I think. I think that's right. And I started out as a OTR guy right out with my own authority. Um, I didn't have any experience with uh, ELDs or logbooks, so I didn't really have any way to do it through a company base without going, you know, starting right at the bottom. I decided that the best thing for me was to just jump right in and, I, you know, I got my own rig, established my own authority. Of course, before I did any of that, I had run return on investment summary and and looked at a lot of numbers. Um, what I didn't know at the time is that freight rates fluctuate dramatically and I wasn't able to grab a big data section. At least I didn't have the wherewithal to, uh, to find the data from multiple years. So I, I, I knew that rates were on the decline and uh, I ran what I thought were really conservative numbers and they look really good. And you know, all in all, it's not bad. Able to make the ends meet, uh, barring any major catastrophes with the truck, obviously any big accidents. Um, you know, there's a lot of risk in this, in this business and I knew there was. Um, so this isn't a sob story or anything. I'm just touching base with you guys. Uh, rates are low. My averages have probably dropped down to around $1.60, $1.70 a mile. Um, I haven't looked at it. I don't know that I really want to look at it, but I, I haven't run that report to see exactly where I was at. Uh, up until, uh, let's say, September, I had run the numbers. I was running $1.91 a mile. Not a ton of miles. Um, and that was probably a five-month look at, at the business from the beginning. So a dollar ninety one is not bad, uh, especially if you did eighty, ninety, hundred thousand miles. I think I had only done about forty thousand miles when I was running that dollar ninety one. Again, I, it looks looks fine. Um, been able to pay back some capital expense, paying off this rig. Uh, so all in all, it's going okay. Uh, the hardest time by far is being away from the family and balancing that homework, home time, work life issue that I think all OTR guys deal with. Uh, I've tried to educate myself while I'm out here and that's been good. Uh, I've been So today I'm just sitting here out in Kansas City at this crappy little truck stop, but it's not even a truck stop, it's a gas station that has some parking spots. I had just gotten my alignment done yesterday at Alignment Solutions in Kansas City, which is a less than professional looking shop, but I'll tell you what. Chad over there obviously really knows his stuff. Highly recommend this guy to anybody who's struggling with alignment because it's a it's a science. And uh, Chad's a specialist. That look, I think that's all he does. And it's and it's there's a truck shop right there as well. So if he does find any mechanical issues, because that's one of the things he'll do is the first thing he's going to do is look at all the steering components, look at anything that um, may cause the alignment to not be the problem, or at least not be the solution to whatever your deal is. You're gonna look at your springs, your frame rail, uh, all your tie rods, you know, anything related to the steering components, make sure that there's no slop in there. And if there is, and obviously you say, look, we have gotta get this fixed before an alignment's gonna do you any good. So you gotta love somebody who's gonna say, look, there's no point in me doing an alignment until we get this, this issue fixed because an alignment's not going to fix it. So you got to like that. Anyway, he had me in and out of there and probably an hour after looking over everything, made several adjustments. And I only drove about 20 miles to go to where I'm parked now and I'll be parked here today and tomorrow. But I mean, <laughs> he had noticed immediately, immediately how much better the truck rode. Now, I just found a small coolant leak. Um, it's happening when 
my engine is cold and I'm running my APU and as it funnels it through the engine there's a small leak at uh, it looks like an inbound and an outbound line going into the block it's not bad and I did notice it before but I also noticed that it went away and I think it goes away when the engines warmed up and it expands and I think it seals that up but anyway unfortunately I have to get that looked at as well just really trying to stay on top of the equipment uh, as far as equipment goes one of the things I've had a lot of luck with is I've been changing my oil when I got this rig the oil was black black like got some on my hand took a week to get it off black sooty uh, bought it with 400,000 miles it was a Navajo truck but all in all it just felt well it drove well everything felt tight about it I ran the uh, hours and did a metric on how many miles versus how many hours and it had averaged 50 miles an hour so clearly it hadn't been idling which is a big deal to me especially since it has a def system so that was the easiest metric that I could run I was not going to start tearing apart stuff I know that that's highly recommended you know to get into the case and look and see you know if you can find any wear issues or um any soot piling up but that's just not what I was going to do uh, so the easiest quickest metric I could do is I just divided how many miles by how many hours and you can tell you know the average speed so if the, if the motor's been idling for any significant amount of time that's going to really reduce your average mile per mile per hour so when I did this it came out at just above 50 miles per hour so it's clearly had not been idling very much in my mind and this is a metric that I pulled just straight off of intuition but you know I think if you're around 35 40 miles per hour that's not good and then anywhere above 50 is good uh, on average you know I run when I run I run long I don't idle and I average about 50 miles per hour um, this truck is geared with a 308 rear end which is really really tall gears so it is a dog 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 in the hills but i can drive 65 70 miles an hour and still be at a decently low rpm and therefore get decent mile per gallon you know i can i can do 65 miles 70 miles an hour depending on the grades and still get over seven miles per gallon so i don't know if i would do it different i think i probably would i think i probably would go for uh, more like a 336 in the rear end or even something higher 377 I've seen uh, just because I hope to be able to run the hills out by where I live and stay a little closer to home uh, I haven't been able to do that because the rates just don't and and then the freight the freight volumes out there so between the how much freight there is running around my house and how little it pays it just hasn't justified it I, you know, honestly, to run, you say, between Denver and where I live, the rates are not bad. Um, getting backhaul freights down to Denver, our, our, our backhaul freight back to Denver is less than reliable. It's not consistent. So that kind of stinks. Um, but the, the one-way lane rates are not bad either way. You know, obviously if you're trying to get out of the state of Colorado that you can get really beat up but to stay in the state is not horrible um, I don't know what their interest interstate intra state laws are but I've just kind of been taken you know since I'm a resident of Colorado I'm I'm gonna ask forgiveness rather than permission if anything ever comes up regarding that and it hasn't the, the loads that do move interstate, especially if they're going up and down the mountains, are heavy. They are always trying to max you out because the lane rates are high in there. And most of it's like either recycled cardboard, baking soda, or uh, beer. I've seen soda loads and stuff too, but all of those are always trying to max it out because you know, shipping costs are high on those guys. So that's that's another downside to it is the the grades are long they're steep when it snows it snows bad it snows hot and heavy and I you know I've heard lots of different stories but one thing I do have experience with in this industry is is hauling mountain passes 
in adverse conditions as well. And heavy is not your friend. I don't care about traction. I don't care. It is not your friend. Uh, it may be your friend if it was like a blizzard and and the wind's blowing 40 miles an hour sideways. Yeah, maybe the weight is a little bit your friend in that situation, but you shouldn't be hauling <laughs> in those situations anyway. Just pull over, let it let it die down. There's enough plows in the state. They'll catch up on it a little bit and uh, and then get back to rolling. That is if you can get your way back on the road because now you're gonna have a snow berm that the, that the plow made and you may be boxed in. But again, this is why, this is why the industry is, is loved and hated are these little dynamics anyway uh, I did want to touch real quick I've already been going for 11 minutes I did want to touch really quick on the, uh, the recession which I do believe is coming um, I do believe that we're I, I think we're in a recession now and, and just to be clear recession is defined as two quarters of GDP with negative growth so the economy in the United States grows negatively for two consecutive quarters, so six months, right? Um, that being said, you don't really know you're in recession until the Fed puts out numbers and they don't, you know, normally you're two months, three months out before they have all their revisions done. So you may not know you've been in recession for the last six months until nine months. So you could be nine months into a recession before you know you've been in recession for the last six months or you know you geez by the time they announce recession you may have you may already be out of it so recession is not a boogeyman however i do believe that this next correction that we'll see in the united states economy and probably the global economy is a big boogeyman and the, the piper has to be paid uh the the financials are all screwed up the entire finance market worldwide is an absolute sham. There's really no accountability. There's insurance on insurance on insurance debt. There, there's way, way, way more debt in the system than there is money. And people say, well, that's impossible. How can you have more debt than there is money to back up the debt? Well, it's a complicated thing and maybe we could talk about it sometime, but that's the reality. Uh, the only way to pay off the current debt is to issue more debt in the current system. That's the way it's been since 1971, uh, since Nixon took us off the gold, well, what was left of a, of a gold standard when Nixon ended the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, which wasn't even a real gold standard, it was called a, a, a gold reserve standard. I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this thing. But since 1971, the financial system has been nothing but smoke and mirrors, and I think it's finally coming to an end. In the long run, I absolutely believe it's gonna be a good thing. Uh, in the short run, I think it's gonna be a really bad thing. But the good news is, is this is why I entered this industry. Not because it was my dream to be an OTR guy, to you know make the road my home, even though I have found quite a bit of enjoyment out here, quite a bit of excitement. I've learned a ton, especially from the guys out here who've been doing it for a long time. Um, however, I, this industry has to survive. If it doesn't survive, if, if the trucking industry falls apart, all industry goes down, all production, it doesn't matter how much you produce if you can't get it to where it's going. And there is no viable alternative to the current trucking infrastructure, which gets raw products to the producers or the manufacturers and gets their finished products to, to the retail establishments. So it has to survive. I mean, frankly, the last guy who tried to put a shutdown on it, well, they still haven't found his body. James Hoffa is who that is, in case you're wondering. You know, he, he organized a bunch of truckers, started the Teamsters, and um, they did a trucker strike, and didn't end up real well for him. I, I, I respect the idea of organizing the industry, but I also know that, you know, since it affects so many different um, industrial centers and, and, and money centers, that if that can be stopped, they're going to put a stop to it. And by they, I don't know who they are, but anybody who's, who can keep that from happening, they're going to do their best to keep it from happening because it's in everybody's best interest. I shouldn't say everybody. The people who make a lot of money right now, it's in their best interest to make sure that 
you know, the trucking industry stays divided. Carter deregulated the industry and allowed uh, guys like me to come into it. And I'm all about deregs. I'm, I'm all about deregulation. I have no doubt that if we were to somehow snap your fingers and get rid of the FMSCSA overnight that uh, things would get worse before they would get better. But I think when we came out the other side, it would be a whole lot better. I mean a whole lot better. The industries would be forced to regulate themselves. Shippers are not going to just throw a, a load on the cheapest truck just because it's willing to run the lane for the cheapest price if there's a doubt that it's going to you know, that all the due diligence is going to be done to get the product to where it's supposed to go. Insurance companies are not going to be insuring product that they don't have a, a really, really good expectation that that carrier is going to get it to where it's supposed to go in one piece. So, yeah, I mean, it's in everybody's financial interest that regulation takes place. But when it's done from a top-down basis, uh, yeah, I mean... Gee whiz, it's it's never good. Look at the DMV. Look at look at the. I know there's a lot of guys out there who have a lot of respect for, uh, you know, the, the the veterans hospitals. But in my experience, they are not somewhere I'd want to go to get medical care done. That's top down stuff. However, the private doctors, the ones who work on, you know, the friends that I have who are quite wealthy, independent doctors, they don't take insurance. They take they take payment. You know, and, and they're the best of the best of the best. Of course, they don't have trauma facilities and stuff like hospitals do. But in those situations, yeah, you got to go to those. And then there are private institutions that do accept insurance as well. So anyway, I've gone off on this for long enough. I'm just going to wrap it up right now. So just wish everybody stay safe out there. Careful out there in the snow. Um, and have a happy Thanksgiving if I don't talk to you before that. Okay, guys, thanks.